Well, hello, interwebs. Welcome back to Last Bastion Labs, your safe space for makers. I'm Tim, and this week, we're making some bolt-on love. Why on God's green earth would you buy something when you can make something for almost three times the cost? Why? Because it's custom, and custom is cool. I've noticed that some of the really cool makers out there have some bling on their vice. Now, you could point out that I will never be cool, and the wife unit would agree with you. Just because I'm not cool doesn't mean I can't bling out my vice with a little bit of bolt-on love. How many different parts on this bench can you identify have been in videos? Feel free to comment. I've never really been happy with these jaws when doing finishing work on parts that I've just spent hours machining. One day not too long ago, I ran across Quinn from Blondie Hacks. She was making a set of copper jaws for her vice, and I thought, now that is the ticket cricket. Quinn pointed out in her video that milling copper is challenging. So before I set out to make chips, I researched the topic within an inch of its life. And when I say research the topic, I mean I sat down with a glass of scotch and watched some YouTube. After about the second glass of scotch, I think it was the second, well, who's counting? I noticed that some of the folks had trouble and some of the folks did not when they were milling copper. Nobody really had any trouble when it came to facing the part or squaring up the stock on the edges. All the trouble began when they went to pocket. In conventional milling, when we pocket, we, like, we come in to the part and then we move across the part and when we reach the end, we pull the cutter out. The issue that we run into is that Right there, you can see that we have a lot of engagement on the cutter. From this point all the way to here is fully engaged on the cutter. The folks who didn't have any trouble were running an adaptive toolpath on their CNC machine. And an adaptive toolpath, by definition, maintains a constant chip load on the cutter. So our toolpath. is something like this. So the cutter comes in and maintains a constant chip load on the cutter throughout the entire portion of the cut. As near as I could tell, if you were running an adaptive toolpath, copper was not an issue. If you were conventional milling, these corners were going to give you trouble. Now I have to tell you, I was a little bit worried or concerned about cutting copper for the very first time. You're looking at, in this piece, roughly $22 worth of copper. Where did I get the copper, you would ask? At Shoepan's Boneyard. This is my favorite place to buy material, and if you're a hobbyist, you should look them up. I will leave a link in the descriptions. Within the Boneyard, you can find all your favorite metals, aluminum, copper, bronze, different types of plastic in several different cross sections, bar stock, sheet, round, tube, hexed. And once you've made your selection, you can kind of pick through and find hopefully an appropriate width and length that you're looking for. And as long as you've met the $65 minimum charge, it's free delivery and it, there is no cutting charge. I bought a 12 inch piece of brass and had it cut into half inch medallions for my challenge coin video. The surface finish from the saw cut is outstanding. The dimensions varied by about four thaw part to part. As home shop machinists, we thrive on drops. The problem with drops is sometimes you don't get what you asked for. At Shoe Pan, there's no mystery metal. What you asked for is what you get. So before I scrapped out $22 in copper, I went to test out the tool path and just did it in wood. My design I extended the jaws so they'd be a little bit taller in the vise, basically because that was how much material I could get away with and still make a full slot down the length of this part and get two parts out of one piece. You'll notice the decorative snake skin that I did on the face of the jaws. At the end of the day, I'm not really sure if I will like this in my vise from an operational standpoint. And if I don't, I'll just face it off. Do the jaws really need that fancy pattern? Probably not. 
But I often take times like this on a simple project to expand my tool set. I have some other videos on 1911 mainspring housings that I want to start doing some decorative patterns on, so I thought this would be a good place to do some of the learning. So enough talk, let's go make some chips. Whoa, not so fast. What about the cam? I had a couple of requests to review the cam uh, for some of my projects. So this was pretty much straightforward, except that we were cutting copper, so our feeds and speeds were a little bit different. But we start with a facing operation, a 3D adaptive to clean out the material, and you can see that we are going to run a full slotting operation down the width of this part followed by a 2D contour to clean up the sides, and then a chamfer to make it look like a really cool machined part. My feeds and speeds for using the Lakeshore Carbide Cutter and with the aluminum insert, 2500 RPM at 5 point, or 10.5 inches per minute. My depth of cut was 5 thou. For the adaptive, we're running a three flute quarter inch end mill by Lakeshore Carbide at 7,500 RPM, 31 inches per minute, and a width of cut of 30 thou, and a 0.5 depth of cut. The recommendation for cutting copper that I found on the internet was to take your normal aluminum speed feeds and speeds and run them about 70%. We'll run the simulation. There's our facing cut to make that surface all nice and clean. Followed by the adaptive tool path. You can see the full length of the slot there. Followed by the 2D contour. And chamfering. And we'll turn off the model. Voila. Don't bother adjusting your sound. I'm running the new Stealth Package from Tormach. Isn't it great? It's almost like not turning on your microphone. So far so good, but it's that slot, the full length of the part, that has me concerned. Wow, that was amazing. You should have seen that Lakeshore Carbide end mill hog out that slot. I'm sorry. I apparently forgot to hit the record button. At the time, my mind was a little bit more on the part than it was on the video. Again, my apologies. Everything did work out exactly as it should. I'm not entirely unpleased with that at all. Yes, sir. That is 100% made in America machine porn. Off camera, I separated the parts on my bandsaw. And now I'm using a half-inch Lakeshore carbide cutter to remove the cap. The cam for this final operation is at the very end of the video. I will tell you that when I finished this operation that the copper was very very hot. You could keep your hand on the part but you didn't want to keep it there. I let it cool down before I went into the facing op. Now we add the counter bore and the through holes. those chips fly. Now we'll clean up about two thousandths of material with a 2D adaptive and spot drill. That's less than optimal. I guess I'm going to have to work on that. And a quick cleanup with a 2D contour. I loved how the blue layout fluid turned green on the copper part. Is that what you call copper green? 
Finally, the snakeskin pattern. I'm running an eighth inch 90 degree chamfer tool at five thou depth of cut. And as you can tell from the burrs, five thou was a little deep. When I ran the second jaw, I ran it at uh, two passes at half five thou. I think I'm going to save those chips. They'd be perfect for a blue oxide video. And last but not least, a nice chamfer to make the part look like an awesome machine part. Chamfers are cool. I'm trying a John Saunders trick of using a fly cutter to remove the burr off of the part. My goal is to just move back and forth gently, moving the cutter down, taking the burr off, but not removing the blue. I am not entirely unpleased with that. And now for a quick deburr. The pink paint is for my daughter's rocket. During the COVID, I find myself now teaching second grade sciences, and it's a project we're working on together. Now time for a little engraving. I'm running a Lakeshore Carbide 60 degree engraving tool at 5 thou depth of cut. And now for the other jaw. This time I'm at 2 thou depth of cut and you can see it's a much, much nicer cut. 10,000 RPM. We have two acronyms here at Last Bastion Labs. Master Diabolical Plan, or MDP, and TADFA, for Timmy Austin Doesn't Fart Around. There you have it. Newly installed custom copper jaws. Bolt-on love at its finest. So the face of the jaws feel pretty good to the touch. Let's stick in a piece of uh, engineering paper and clamp down on it and see if that tells us anything. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the camera, but right there on this side of the jaw, on this side, appears to be just rough enough to put a small indentation into the paper, but the rest of it looks pretty good. All in all, I'm not entirely unpleased with how those turned out. Again, if I don't, if I find this decorative pattern is causing me to smar up parts, I'll just face it off. But it was a good learning opportunity and it was kind of fun. Made some cool looking jaws. You know what would really make this pop? A set of click spring blue screws. So to wrap things up for today, I'd like to mention a few points. One, I am not sponsored by ShoePan. I've just been very pleased with the service they provide. For the three out of my 47 subscribers who have asked to see the cam, I've included that at the end of the video. If you like seeing chips fly, I highly recommend that you check out Quinn at Blondiax. She does a great job. Lastly, I know a lot of you out there are bored right now, and I'd like to point out that you don't need a bunch of expensive equipment to build something cool. If you loved rockets as a kid, you'll love them even more as an adult. Chances are you've got a lot more patience now, and you, if you've got time on your hand, then you have time to do it right. They're not that expensive, and hey, they're just cool. As always, I'd like to thank you for your time. If you enjoyed what you saw, please hit the like button, and don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, design, build, modify, and perfect your world, one part at a time. I'm Tim Austin from Last Bastion Labs, your safe space for makers.
Let's cover how I did the snake skin on the second op. First of all, I started with a sketch on the part, and I just made a simple pattern based on the center line, and then mirrored it to the other side, grabbed this guy, and ran a pattern both to the left and to the right, and then repeated that pattern for this one on the left and the right to get my sketch. So for the second op, everything was pretty much the same as the first. There's a facing operation, then there's a boring, counter bore. For the most part, we're all just standards, feeds, and speeds, following the same rules we've already discussed. To do the snake skin, I went in to use a trace pattern, and I was using a quarter inch, or excuse me, I was using an eighth inch, 45 degree chamfer tool at 100,000 RPM at 20 inches per minute with five thou depth of cut. And I had to go through and select every one of these lines. And of course, smoothing with a minus 5,000 depth of cut. 